All right, good evening. Glad you could come and join us. Thank you for those that are joining us online uh, for our Bible study this evening. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into it. Father, we thank you for today, the opportunity to gather, to look at your word, to study it, to share prayer requests and bring things to you that are heavy on our hearts, that are challenging us, that are encouraging us. We just pray that you might be glorified during this time together tonight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Revelation chapter 15 is where we're at tonight. This is our 25th lesson in Revelation. We've been at this a while. Uh, Revelation 15. I'm going to start just by reading the chapter tonight. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And I saw something like a great like a sea of glass mingled with fire, those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints, who shall not fear you, who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name. For you alone are holy, and for all nations have come and worshiped before you. For your judgments have been manifested. After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony of heaven was opened. And out of the temple came the seven angels, having the seven plagues, clothed in purple, or <laughs> clothed in pure bright linen, having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls, full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from the power. No one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Well, as we get into chapter 15, it would be helpful if we look back at highlights of Revelation. What do you remember about the first three chapters of Revelation? They were about the churches. Yeah, the, the letters to the seven churches. And then as we got to chapters 4 and 5, what happened? This was the scene of the throne room, remember? This is where we, the song, if you remember singing, Worthy is the Lamb, that, that is taken right there from Revelation chapter 5. And then uh, and as we got to chapter 6, uh, the judgments start to come. And the seal judgments is what start in chapter 6. The first one of those judgments, if you remember, was a, one that went out in conquering on a white horse. The second seal judgment, or second, yeah, seal judgment, was a red horse taking peace from the earth so that people would kill one another. The third was a black horse with scales. Uh, coming in and it's talking about the cost of wheat, cost of barley, things were very expensive. Uh, oh, days wages to, to buy um, food. The fourth, the pale horse, the core of the earth to kill with the sword, hunger and death by the beast of the earth. And the fifth seal, martyrs cry from beneath the altar. And it's, it, it's, it explains there's going to be more martyrs until the number was completed. And then the sixth seal, all kinds of cosmic things take place from earthquakes, the sun turns black, the moon turns like blood, stars fall, the wind knocks off uh, the figs from the trees, so the fruit is affected, uh, the sky recedes, and the mountains and the islands are moved. You think that would get people's attention when all those things start going on. Uh, and then there's an interlude, chapter 7, and then the seventh seal is in chapters 8 and 9, and the seventh seal is the seven trumpets. The first of the trumpets is the third of the trees, and all the green grass was burned up from the fire. The second, the, that's green grass, not green gas. I, I had a typo, I wrote it down, went to correct it, and then forgot to type, type it in. So I, you got all my typos in your paper tonight. Um, the third of the trees, all green grass, was burned up. The second, the seas struck a third of the sea. Uh, it became blood, and a third of living creatures died. A third of the ships were destroyed. So great economic impacts going on. 
Uh, just as we've seen red tide affecting a few of the beaches around, the fishermen have been concerned about economy here and how that's going to affect. Uh, a third of the seas is, is going to be massive. And the third sea, or seal is the stars fall from heaven, make a third of the rivers and springs wormwood or bitter. This kills many people. Uh, the fourth seal, you have a third of the moon and the stars are darkened. And then in chapter 8, verse 13, it says, And I looked, and I heard the angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. Oh. So as we were in the trumpets, not the seals, I said seals a couple of times there. We're in the trumpet judgment. The last three trumpet judgments here are referred to as three woes. Uh, things get even more intense. The fifth one, the locusts uh, from the bottomless pit, they have, remember they had the tails like scorpions, and uh, they went to harm men uh, who did not have God's seal. And in chapter 9, verse 12, it talks about one woe being fat passed. So that first woe, that fifth seal is done, the first, fifth trumpet is done. And then the sixth trumpet, uh, four angels are released. And they bring three plagues to kill a third of mankind. Fire, smoke, and brimstone come out of their mouths. So uh, very bleak days on the earth as all of these things are taking place. Uh, though Satan is involved in releasing these powers, and some of God is in sovereign control, nothing is taking place that he is not permitting as he is releasing judgment on the earth. In chapters 10 and 11, there's an interlude here. In chapter 11, then, at the end of it, introduces the seventh trumpet. In verse 18, it says, uh, The nations were angry, your wrath has come, the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants of prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, to destroy those who destroy the earth. It's a preview of this trumpet, the last trumpet uh, judgment here. Chapters 12 through 14, we saw a view of the earth from Satan's perspective and what was take, going on with him and the beasts. And then uh, as we come to chapter 15, finally, we have the announcements of the bold judgments. Chapter 15, verse 1, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. So another sign that it's great and marvelous. This is bringing about the climax of the outpouring of God's wrath on man. Um, on man, the world, Satan, and the two beasts. Um, we read John 3.36, I believe, last Sunday. Uh, he that believes not the Son of God shall not have life in the wrath, the wrath of God abides on him. Um, wrath is building, but one day God will let it go, pour it out, and this is part of what's taking place as these vials, these bowls, are being poured out. The sign here is the seven angels who are controlling these plagues that are about to be poured out. And if you want to look at it later, you can. We're not going to look at them all tonight. But these seven angels appear seven times as a group. Verses 6, 7, and 8, this chapter, and then chapter 16, chapter 17, chapter 21. Nine times they appear individually as they pour out these. Uh, John's simply introducing them here at the beginning of chapter 15. And they're not going to begin to act until down in verse 6. So uh, they're introduced here, and what's going on later on, what we're going to see as we get there. There are parallels here to the plagues of Egypt, and uh, one writer says their similarity suggests that God's purpose in both series of judgments is the same, to punish godless idolaters, to liberate the godly for future blessing and service. He liberated the Israelites from Pharaoh, He's going to liberate believers from uh, the wicked rulers on earth and all that they've put up with. But it says here also that uh, in verse 15, 1, for, the, for in them the wrath of God is complete, where the wrath of God is filled up. How many of you have ever heard a parent or a teacher say, 
I've had it up to here. That's, that's what went through my mind when I read the wrath of God is filled up. He's been long-suffering. He's been patient. He has given people, uh, Romans says it's your kindness that leads to repentance. He's given people opportunity to repent. First Peter says he's not willing that any should perish, but all should come repentance. But yet, when the time is done, judgment will come. It will be too late, as it is when people die today. Um, Tom Constable here says this truly I'm sorry this is Glenn Cummings this truly is the end of long suffering of God according to 2 Peter 3 and Psalm 7 we're living in an age of grace where we continually experience the long suffering of God but his wrath and judgment have been brewing we're now leaning learning boy I told you I left all my typos of the day when the righteous anger of the Lord uh, is restrained for 6,000 years is going to erupt into cataclysmic judgment. Let's look back to 2 Peter 3, 9 and 10. 2 Peter 3, 9 and 10 is not too far back here from where we're at. It says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, but as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Judgment is coming. Psalm 7, way back here. In the Psalms, talking about this day of judgment coming. Psalm 7, 11, B says, God is angry with the wicked every day. If he does not turn back, he will sharpen his sword. He bends his bow and makes it ready. He also prepares for himself instrument of death. He makes his arrows into fiery shafts. So here, God is a just judge, but judgment will come. In Zephaniah 3, 8 was the other verse that was mentioned there. Where it says, Therefore wait for me, says the Lord, until the day I rise up for plunder. My determination is to gather the nations to my assembly of kingdoms to pour on them my indignation. All my fierce anger, all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. So all the earth is going to be devoured. That judgment is still coming. Uh, this writer continues later and says, Time and time again the word of God has issued warnings of the judgment to come. Talbot said, if any man finds himself in eternity unsaved and lost, that man will have no one to blame but himself. In every age and in every day of tribulation, God is, as it were, trying to blockade the way to judgment. He sent his son to die on the cross to pay the penalty of sin. He has sent prophets. He sent his disciples to write down the scriptures. He has sent his followers to proclaim the word. People have had the opportunity to turn to him, and uh, they will be guilty. In verse 2, I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who are victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark, over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. So he's before the sea of glass, where it's mingled with fire. This sea, uh, Constable says, John again saw the sea of glass that was similar to crystal. Though here he wrote that it also had fire in it. The sea most likely represents the holiness and majesty of God that separates him from creation. The fire suggests the judgment that's about to come. Another view is that the fiery sea represents a persecution by the beast during the tribulation. Well, but here are the tribulation martyrs standing before this. It says they have victory over the beast. Uh, they've got through the martyrdom. Revelation 13, 7 says it was granted to him to make war with the saints and overcome them and the authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. In uh, chapter 6 and verse 11 Let's see if 
think that's a typo. Then the white robes were given to each of them, and it said that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. So there's these martyrs who are giving their lives. Verse 14, And I said unto him, Sir, you know, and he said, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation, washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. In chapter 12, verse 11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. So their victory over the beast comes not in what they accomplished, but in what the blood of Jesus Christ accomplished in them. And the salvation that they have in spite of being martyred. Uh, but they have victory over, it says, his image, over the mark. And uh, as we said, the reference is the work of God, not of men. And what are they saying? It says they sing the song of Moses. Exodus chapter 15, if we go back, there's the song of Moses as they came out of Israel. Out of Israel, out of Egypt. Song of Moses as they came out of Israel. It says, Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider he's thrown them into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. He's become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise him. He is he, my father's God and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army. He's cast in the sea. He's chosen captains also are drowned in this Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank to the bottom like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. And in the greatness of your excellence, you have overthrown those who rose against you. You sent forth your wrath that consumed them like stubble. And with the blast of your nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright like a heap. The depths congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall be satisfied on them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fear and praises, doing wonders? You stretch out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. You and your mercies have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. The people will hear and be afraid. Sorrow will take hold of the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom will be dismayed. The mighty men of Moab trembling will take hold of them. All the inhabitants of hate, Canaan, will melt away. Fear and dread will fall on them. By the greatness of your arm, they will be as still as stone. Till your people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over, whom you have purchased, you will bring them into the inn and plant them in the mountains of your inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which you have made for your own dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. For the horses of Pharaoh went with his chariots and his horsemen into the sea, and the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. So the celebration here of Moses' song, there's a, some would say it's back in, at the end of Deuteronomy. We're not going to read all this because this is like 45 or 46 verses. But in Deuteronomy 31, you can glance at it there. Uh, 31 and most of 32. Just revo- rejoicing in who God is and what he's going to accomplish. Uh, there they were rejoicing in, in crossing the sea. But besides the song of Moses, they sang the song of the Lamb. And uh, many believe that that is the song back in Revelation chapter 5. That was the new song that was sung in Revelation 5. And it is the song of the Lamb. I referenced it earlier. Verse 9 says, You are worthy to take the scroll to open its seal. For you were slain, you've redeemed it us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth and then they said with loud voice verse 12 worthy is a lamb who was slain to receive power and riches wisdom strength honor and glory and blessing and then verse 13 blessing and honor glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever oh. now in Revelation, there's actually seems to be another verse that they add uh, that they're singing here. 
Uh, great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty, just, true, are your ways, O King of the saints, who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name, for you alone are holy, for all the nations come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. So what are they singing about? What is the content? Well, it's they sing to the sovereign God, the Lord God Almighty. They're praising Him, glorifying Him. Oh. It says, great and mighty are your works. He's showing His power. He's revealed His power in the past, just and true. He, he's proper in the way He rules. Most governments can't say that today. Just and true. Uh, most people really don't understand genuine justice and honesty. Uh, he's, he's referred to as the Lord there, so He's King of the Saints. Uh, so He's showing He's the one that deserves praise, that, and they're giving Him that praise. His divine attribute of holiness is talked about. What does it mean to be holy? Sure. Righteous, pure. It's amazing to me, uh, how do we normally hear the word holy used? Not pure. Yeah, holy cow, holy moly, holy, all kinds of things. And just, so to most people, when we say God is holy, what does that even mean to them? It's so far removed from his set-apartness from mankind and man's sinfulness and his perfections that uh, most cannot fathom that. It's hard for us to, to grasp. Uh, because we live in a sin-cursed body in a sin-cursed world and community, it's hard to us for us to imagine what would it be like to be free of sin. To not have wrong thoughts, to not have wrong speech, to not have things said about us that aren't kind and helpful, uh, to not have uh, the giving into temptation that takes place and all the depravity that is all around us. Uh, but God is holy. And then the, the verse 4 seems to refer to the coming millennial reign. Who shall not fear you? As if all are going to be bowing down, and that's what we're promised will one day happen. And then at the end of the verse, for your judgments have been manifested. After he's done judging, those that left will be bowing. Um, so we have these things coming. And then in verse 5, we have the opening of the heavenly temple. There seems to be a connection here all the way back to Revelation 11, 19 where he said there was a precursor going on to this seventh trumpet. It says, The temple of God was opened in heaven. The ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. Lightnings, noises, thunderings, earthquake, and great hall. The temple was seen in, but here it seems to be talking about going in and the first tabern tabernacle uh, that was built on, in, that is in heaven, uh, is what the earthly tabernacle, tabernacle is patterned by. And it's called the tabernacle of the testimony, uh, or the holy of holies. This is the place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. The testimony was inside the Ark. What do we mean by the testimony? The law. The law. Remember they had the Ten Commandments in the Ark, so it was the Ark of the Testimony, the Tabernacle of Testimony. What else was in the ark? Do you remember? Bowl of manna. Aaron's rod. Aaron's rod that budded. Those three things. The, tar the, the Ten Commandments, the bowl of manna, and Aaron's rod that budded. Uh, in Revelation 11, 19, we, we mentioned that you saw the temple open here. The inner sanctuaries opened up. Uh, verses 6 and 7. Uh, God is ministering judgment. Out of the temple came the seven angels, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, having their chests girded with golden brands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls, 
full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. So they, they're coming from God's presence. They have seven plagues with them. And they're clothed in bright linen with a chest girded with golden bands. And white in scriptures often dealing with purity or righteousness. We'll see that again in Revelation 19. Gold's often dealing with deity, those that rule. These bowls or vials, as some of the translations call them, notice it says they're full of the wrath of God. They're full of the wrath of God. Chapter 14, 10 says, He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of holy angels in the presence of the Lamb. So God's wrath is ready to be poured out of these vials. And as this is taking place, verse 8, it says, The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. The smoke of the glory of God. If you remember in the Old Testament tabernacle, when they were dedicating it, like when Solomon built the temple, what was it like? Seven thousand oxen and three thousand, or seven thousand sheep and three thousand oxen, and it was a, a, thousands of animals. But then it talked about the temple being full of God's glory and the, the clouds and smoke. People couldn't get in. Here, the heavenly temple is filled with smoke, uh, evidence of God's glory and power, and no one is going to get in until God's justice is satisfied. Uh, there's some writers who believe that while the temple is closed, they're in heaven, that there will be no answered prayer because that judgment's being poured out on the wicked and uh, time is up. I don't know where they get that scripture, but interesting idea. If God shuts the temple down with smoke as his judgment comes. Uh, how do we apply this? What do we think? Well, God is still in control. God will be in control till the end. And God will be glorified even as people reject him and he has to pour out his judgment. He is still glorified. Uh, people that say that God is all grace in the New Testament have not read these passages because God's wrath is being poured out on sin. And judgment is coming. Uh, we still need to share the gospel. People need to come to Christ. Uh, it's not an uh, universalism doesn't fit in these passages of Revelation where some people think that everyone will be saved uh, because the judgment is obviously coming but uh, God's mercy and grace will reach a limit and then it's too late God will pour out his judgment so we have a challenge if you've not trusted Christ as Savior uh, don't put it off scripture says today is the day of salvation you may not have the opportunity tomorrow to turn to Christ, and uh, we need to prepare, be prepared for his coming. Appreciate you people online joining us. We're going to shut the recording off so we can share private prayer requests. Have a great night.